Can we all, can you guys do me a favor real quick? I want everybody to just close their eyes. Just close their eyes for a minute. Let's just focus on the Lord. Let's just thank Him. Father God, we thank You for Your goodness. Lord, we thank You for Your Son, Jesus. We thank You for sacrifice on, on, on Calvary. God, we thank You for writing our name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, for, for going to prepare a place for us. Lord God, I thank You that in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm welcome there. There's a place for me there. And God, right now, I pray that you would be with your people, Lord. I pray that you would stir them up right now. Stir the spirit up on the inside of them, God. I pray that you would give them ears to hear what you have to say. Lord God, I pray that you would be with me right now, Father God. Use me as a vessel, as a mouthpiece. Lord God, I give you all the glory for everything, God. I, I want none of your glory, Lord God. I want you to have all of it. I give you the honor for your words, Lord. And let everything that comes out of my mouth be the Holy Spirit. Let it be uncontested, God, before you. And Lord God, I pray that you would do a work in your people tonight, Father. That would change who they are forever and get them closer to you. And Lord God, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, listen, guys, I've been preaching the word of God since I was 17. Now, I'm 36 right now, so by my math... I've been preaching longer than I have it. Do you understand? I've been preaching the Word of God longer than I have it. I've been serving God. I've been faithful to read His Word. I, I've been, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I praise God. I worship God. I've been faithful with God. Since I started serving God, I have not turned my back on it. Amen? I haven't turned my back on it. And I'm not up here to say that to, to brag and go, don't you wish you guys could be like me? Now, that's not what I'm saying at all, because I'm sure some of you guys have been serving God way longer than 18, 19 years, and you haven't turned your back on Him, and you've been faithful, and you've been uh, prayerful. But let me, I, I say that to say this, I'm not the man I was six months ago. Do you understand? I'm not who I was six months ago. So if you're in this place tonight, and you come here based purely on tradition, of that's what you do on Sunday nights. And you think that there's no way you can get closer. There's no way you can understand more. There's no way you can have a better relationship with the Father. If you think you've arrived tonight, then the Word of God has been sent to you that know you have it. Amen? It don't matter if you shout me down or not. It's the truth. It's in the Bible. All right, so I want to give you this word tonight. I want to share something with you tonight that has been a fire consuming on the inside of me. I want to share with you guys tonight a word that has, has, has literally helped to change my life and helped to make me different. And I'm proud to say after, after, after 36 years of, of, of being alive and 18 or 19 of those, I'm not real good at the math, so I can't decide which one it is. It's, it's one of those two. God has changed me in the last six months more than in all those years combined. By doing one simple thing in my life. And Bill, man, outstanding word this morning. Outstanding word this morning, man. God used you in a powerful way, in a great way, and I hope that everybody got it. I hope that everybody got it. It is important to serve, amen? That's what we're here to do. That's what we've been called to do, to serve, amen? That's exactly what, I love that verse you use. It says, Jesus, knowing that he had received everything from the Father, knowing the authority that he had, where he came from, where he was going, knowing who he was as the Son of God, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, amen, as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as the Rose of Sharon, as the Lily of the Valley, as the mighty, wonderful counselor got up and took his clothes off and washed his disciples' feet. He got to the lowest point he could, amen, that's the heart of God. You might have to back this thing down a little bit more. I'm going to be loud. That's our service, amen? To serve other people. That's the heart of God. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And I want to share with you guys something tonight that can make it even better. 
I want to share with you guys something tonight that if you'll put these things to do, together, that you can be more prepared, that God will begin to change your heart. He'll begin to change the way you look at things. He'll begin to change the way you view things and get you more in line with who you are supposed to be, which is grafted into the body of Christ, which is mean we should have the mind of Christ. Amen? That means when we look at a situation, we should be looking at it the way Jesus should see it. Not through judgmental eyes or Pharisee, or eyes of the Pharisees where we're looking at a situation and we judge somebody based on what we think or our perspectives of what's going on, but we look at the situation and say, what is the heart of God in this matter? Amen? I can't help myself when I pass an ambulance to begin to pray for the person in the back of that ambulance because they're having the worst day of their life. Their family is going through a tragedy. But I know that the heart of God is to love that person. Amen? When I'm going down the street and I pass a prostitute walking down the road, I don't look at her critically. I don't look at her judgmentally and go, Oh my goodness, I wish you'd get a real job. You need to straighten your life out. You need to do this. You need to do that. I look at her through the eyes of Jesus and my heart breaks for what breaks his heart. Amen? And again, I'm not trying to tell you this to brag. I'm trying to tell you this that six months ago, I didn't necessarily feel this way. I didn't necessarily feel this way. But I want to show you something. I changed one thing in my life. I changed one. God showed me one thing in the Bible. And I changed one thing in my life. And it changed my life. The Lord changed my life. It didn't just change my life changed my wife's life. Amen? We're one, so it works like that. It begins to have its effect. I begin to present myself to God daily, every day, when I wake up in the morning. And I'm going to show you guys some stuff. I get into the presence of the Lord. Now, the best I can tell right now, we can go through this later if you want to talk about it theologically or whatever, because hopefully maybe you can, you can share some things with me or whatever, but there are three types of the presence of God, the best I can figure out using the scriptures, all right? And I'm going to show you guys what I'm talking about. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, it says, Lord, where can I go to escape your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Now, this is a reference to the omnipresence of God. Amen? The omnipresence of God means that God is everywhere at all times. So I want you guys to do me a favor. Show of hands who's ever been alone. The altar's right down here, liars. What did I just say? God is omnipresent. You have, now listen, this blew my mind when I first thought about it. You have no idea what being alone feels like because you've never been alone. You've been by yourself. You've been without somebody else physically right beside you, I'm sure. But you've never, ever been alone. The Bible teaches us uh, in Hebrews that God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means forsake literally means to turn my back on. I will never leave you nor forsake you. As a matter of fact, as I search scriptures, the best I can find is the only person who's ever been alone or understood what it's like to be alone is Jesus. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's the only one that knows what it's like so far to feel the absence of the presence of God. So we all know what it's like to experience the omnipresence, but none of you know what it's like to not experience the presence of God. I can imagine if God was to remove his presence entirely from you right now, you would fall on this ground weeping. You just think you've been alone. You understand? But God is always around. Literally, the Bible says, even if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Where can I go, Lord, to escape your presence? I can't. I can't, amen? So everybody follows me there. Okay. Then there's the manifested presence of God. Manifest means to make yourself known or to be made known, right? So the Bible teaches us that we're two or three gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst. So how many of you guys like the service this morning? Powerful praise and worship, powerful word, amen? It's the manifest presence of God. That's where God shows up and he comes in this place and he shows himself. Or when God heals somebody, he shows himself. 
Or when God does something, he changes somebody's life and he saves somebody. He shows himself. That's the manifest presence of God. Manifest just means to be made known, right? So that's God making himself known. So you can drive down the road and you're in the car, right, by yourself. You're in the car by yourself and you're just singing whatever, you're chilling out, so on and so forth and everything's fine or whatever. You think you're alone, but really you're experiencing the omnipresence of God, which is God with us all the time, right? And then you drive up here, and, and let's say you drive up here, and you, and you go into Bill's office, and Brother Bill and, and Barry, man, they're back there, and they're having a little prayer session. You walk in there, and you just feel the presence of God. That's the manifest presence of God. Amen? Does everybody understand that? Okay. There we go. So like in Acts chapter number 2, when they were all gathered together in the upper room, the Bible says all of a sudden there come this sound from heaven as if a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house. The manifest presence of God. Everybody understand? Very, very simple. The third one is the intimate presence of God. It's the intimate presence of God. And I want to show you guys this. Now, it says this. Um, the intimate presence of God changes who we are. And I'm going to show you guys because you've experienced intimacy. You've experienced close friendships. You've experienced close relationships. I want to show you this uh, through the word. Some of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why? Because any time you want a relationship, there needs to be communication. Does everybody agree with that? Who's been married? You get that you need to communicate? You understand that? If you, want a good, if you want a good relationship, you've got to communicate. And it can't be one-sided. You've got to communicate back and forth to one another. You've got, to, you've got to share with each other. So you've got to get in there and you've got to communicate with one another. You've got to talk, right? And I'm going to show you guys why this is important in a second. So our closest form of communication, or our, our form of communication with the Lord is prayer. That's talking. It's all it is. You, you, can, you can church up prayer all you want to. But the more you church it up, the more you lean toward the side of the Pharisees where you might as well get out on a street corner and paint your face and, and go, Oh, God, woe is me. I'm talking to you in front of all these people. <laughs> Who are you doing it for? It's for you? Hmm? What's your motive? Anyhow. So, <clears throat> prayer... It's simply, let's boil it down, let's get it down to its it, it, it simplest form. Prayer is communication with God. Amen? It's talking with God. I talk to my wife every day. I talk to her every day. Every day. She tells me things, I tell her things. She tells me things that, that she's unhappy with about me. And I tell her things that I'm unhappy with about me. And we both agree that there are things about me I should change. I'm just kidding. No, we talk, though. We have communication. And without that communication, we would have never even gotten married. We would have never dated. You know what I'm saying? Like, through those communications, we had to learn each other. We had to know about each other. And, and eventually, we got to a, a point where I could tell her anything. And I'm going to show you guys why the intimacy of God is very important, why he desires this, and why it's more than just the omnipresence and the manifested presence of God. Why there is an intimate presence of God, and, and, and he's big enough for each and every one of us. I, I want to show you guys this right now. Okay, listen to me. You don't know, and this is a bold statement. Some of you guys, don't, don't throw me out of the church until I explain it. You don't know the God I know. You don't know him. But here's the thing. I don't know the God you know. You understand? Me and Myra know two different Bill Snows. Right? I've got a relationship based off the communication that I have with Bill Snow and the relationship that I have with Bill Snow. She's got a different relationship based off the communications that she's had with the pastor. Amen? You guys understand what I'm saying? Now, God is big enough to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us, and that's what he desires, to know you personally. And why is that? Let me show you why. Brandon Grammer is one of my best friends in the entire world. Okay? Yeah, I know, brother. God bless you. There are things that I would tell Brandon that there's no way I'd tell you. There's no way. 
me show you guys how this works. There are things that I would tell you guys that I wouldn't tell the rest of the population. You know, I get up here and confess my sins uh, to you guys, and oh, some of you. I hope, I hope that none of you would judge me or go put it on Facebook. Guess what Chris confessed today? Uh, that wouldn't be nice. But anyhow, but there are things that I would tell Brandon about my life or that I'm going through or so on and so forth that I would never tell any of you. What does that mean? That means I'm closer to Brandon than I am to you. You understand? I trust Brandon more than I do you. I trust him with my heart a little bit more than I do you. Do you understand? I don't mean that offensive. If any of you guys want to be as close as me and Brandon are with me, let's hang out. But that's how it's going to have to happen. You're going to have to talk to me. I'm going to have to know more about you. Amen? I know a lot about Brandon. I know stuff that Autumn doesn't know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But here's how this works because there's another step to this. There, all right? There's another step to this. As, as much as Brandon knows about me, there are things that Michelle knows about me that Brandon doesn't know. That's right. There are things that Michelle knows about me that Brandon does not know about me and that I would not share with him. That I wouldn't share with him, but I would only share with her. What does that mean? And as a matter of fact, there is no other human being on this planet that knows more about me than Michelle does. That means that living flesh, she is the closest person to me on this planet. She has been more intimate with me than anybody else on this planet. Does that make you uncomfortable? A little? All right. Well, hold on. Hold on. Because I'm about to make you real uncomfortable with the next statement. All right. Give me grace, Pastor. Listen to me. Why is Michelle closer to me than anybody else on this planet? Amen. Amen. Also, let me tell you guys a little secret. I look better in clothes. I'll explain. I can dress to a certain point where it makes me look a little slimmer. It makes my shoulders look a little broader. It makes my chest look a little better. John, please quit shaking your head no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, even at my skinniest, I've always been fat. You know, so, but oh, that's no big deal. I, I've made my peace with that. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that that's why I'm more close with her, okay? Because the person that you can expose yourself to is the person that you're the closest to. That's just the way it is. I'm talking about marriage. I'm talking about covenant. But here's the deal. As close as I am to Michelle, there may be things in my life, in my past, that I wouldn't even want to share with her. Some of you guys might have stuff that you wouldn't even want to share with her, but I'll share it with the Father. And that means that I'm closer to God than I am to anybody. I'm more willing to share things with the Father than I am with anybody else. And that means that I'm closer to Him. Amen? And that's what God desires. God wants to know you and be known by you. Amen? So it's communication. It's going into... And let me show you something. The Bible says that the, uh, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? And it says that in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. So let's logically think about that. And transient property states that in the presence of the Lord is fullness of strength. Do you understand? If the joy of the Lord is my strength and in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy, then that means in the presence of the Lord is fullness of strength. Do you understand? Why is it like that? Why am I at my strongest, at my happiest, at my best when I'm in the presence of my Father? It's because that's where I was created to be. I was created to be there with him in worship, sharing intimate moments. Amen? I've got to keep my eye on the time. We've got, we got a long way to go. Short time to get there. Come on, eastbound and down. Let's go. Don't finish the song. It says this. The disciples came to him. This is in, uh, this is in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6. I want to show you guys this. I'm going to show you what changed my life, and I'm going to give you guys some evidence behind it throughout the Bible. Even the Old Testament. Okay, some really cool stuff. All right, it says, uh, it says, but when you pray, this is Jesus talking to his disciples when they said, teach me how to pray. He says, but when you pray, let's pause right there. We ain't made it to the first part yet. 
Some of you guys read that as if it says, and if you pray. It doesn't. It says when you pray. Listen to me. There's expectations on my life as a husband. I have expectations on my life as an employee at Aerospace. I have certain expectations on my life as a father. As a youth pastor here at this church, Bill has expectations that he's put on me. To have good character, to teach the Word of God and nothing but the Word of God. To, uh, to be good to our kids, to lead them in the correct path, to be a shepherd for them. He's expecting that. If I break these expectations, what will he say to me? What will happen? He won't stand for it. Do you understand? So as a relationship, as a child, as a son of the Lord, as a daughter of the Lord, God has expectations on your life. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray. This is not optional. This is Christianity 101. This is it right here. This is communication with the Father. When you pray. Now, what happens next is he goes into giving us directions on how to do this. So this means that not only are we expected to pray, but we're expected to pray in this manner that he's about to say. This is an expectation of us that God has on us. Amen? He says this. He says, but when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. He says, when you pray, I want you to do it this way. Go to your room, shut the door, and pray to the Father who is in the secret place. Does he really mean to go to your room and shut your door? What is he saying there? He's saying, I want you to be alone. I want you to be alone. Why? Because this is a secret place. The Father is waiting on you in a secret place. I wrote a blog not too long ago about the secret place. And I started off by explaining how my brother is a fisherman. He's a bass fisherman. He loves the sport of bass fishing, and he takes it deathly serious. And one day, me and my nephew, who's about the same age as me, he, he, he's real close to the age as me, uh, when we were growing up, when we were in our teens and, and, and early 20s, my brother would take us to Logan Martin where he was an expert fisherman down there. He would take us down there, and every once in a while, he would show us a secret place. A honey hole. A hot spot. I spit all in his mind. No worries. He would take us to a secret place and he would show us a place that was right and the conditions were right at that time and it was producing a good bite. And he'd be like, don't show anybody this and don't bring anybody here and don't fish it. Don't fish this place when I'm on tournament day because I'll be fishing on tournament days. We were like, yeah, man, no problem. They are so serious about it that if they take a picture on the river of a fish, they can't have any landmarks in the background. Why? Because if somebody sees that picture, they could look at it and go, I know that house, I know that dock, I know where they're sitting. Let's go there. They'll lie about what side of the river they're on. Yeah, did y'all go up river? No, no, we went down river. I saw you go up river. I talked to you up river. They'll lie about it. To try to protect it, to try to hide it. Why? Because the secret place is valuable to them. It's a secret. So when he showed me that, when he showed my nephew that, it wasn't me. When he showed my nephew that, he was serious about it. He was like, listen, don't do this. Don't take anybody here. Don't bring anybody here. I'm showing this to you. This is something that me and you are bonding over. This is valuable to me and you. So don't take anybody here. And don't fish it on days where I'm in a tournament. Well, my brother Keith goes fishing one morning in a tournament. He pulls up to one of those secret places. And there sits my nephew, fishing his spot with a guy on the boat that he doesn't know. Broke both the rules. So my brother idled over to him, and as serious as he could, told him, if I catch you here again, I will sink your boat. My nephew didn't laugh. He knows my brother, and he knew it wasn't an idle threat. My brother would have sunk his boat without thinking again, without thinking twice about it. He would have tore a rift in the family over this secret place because it was that valuable to him. Amen? When you go into your room, shut your door. Go be alone. Why? Because what God has for you, Barry, is just for you. He wants you to know him. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Amen? 
So when two or three are gathered together and God shows us his manifest presence, that's amazing. When he's always around us and we think about that fact that he's omnipresent, that's amazing. But when we're talking about the secret place and his intimate presence, man, that's amazing. That's amazing. Amen? When you get in that place and you see what it does, that's amazing. And why? Because God wants you to be exposed in there. So when you, and that's why he tells you to shut your door. Amen? He don't want you with your door up. Don't forget it. Leave your door open and get exposed. Amen? That's the truth. God wants you to go in there, and that's the way Jesus put it like that. I want you to go in. I want you to shut your door so that you can be exposed before me. And I want to know you, and I want you to know me. And the Bible says, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. That tells me he's waiting there. He's waiting there. He's waiting there. Do you know how often God spends waiting on us? Think about this. I bet you guys don't read it like this. The, the prodigal son, the Bible teaches us that the prodigal son, he got up, he went into a, another country and wasted all of his money. Now, they didn't have cell phones or fax machines or anything like that. When he was gone, he was just gone. He didn't have no way to check with the father every day. And then one day he's down there and he's, he's feeding the pigs and stuff, which is real low for a Jew. And he's down there and he's feeding the pigs. And he's like, man, I can't believe I'm doing this. How many of my father's servants are going to bed tonight with full stomachs? I'm starving to death. Here's what I'll do. I'll go back to my father and I'll say, Dad, can I come home? Can I just come home? I'll be a servant in your house. You don't have to treat me like a son. So he says, that's what I'll do. So he gets up and he goes back home. Right? He doesn't send a letter. He didn't send a text. He didn't message him on Facebook. He just goes home. And the Bible says that while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him and ran to him. You need to understand the love of God right here because that means that from the day he left, the father went out and spent his time up on the horizon watching, watching the horizon for his return every day. It's the only way he could have spotted him while he was still far away off. God is waiting on you in the secret place. Amen? He's waiting on you to have a personal, intimate relationship with just you individually, and he's big enough to do it. Amen? He wants you to expose who you are to him. That's the same thing that happened with Moses. Moses comes across a burning bush in the desert, and God says, take your shoes off, for the place you're standing is holy ground. We read that, and we think, we, we, we think it's like caps in a church. Oh, you need to take your hat off in here. It's holy ground. What? He's not talking about reverence or respect. He's saying, listen, the dirtiest part of you are, of who you are, I want it on this holy ground. I want your sin touching my holiness. Amen? That's what I want to clean you up. I want to take care of you. God is in the secret place waiting on you. Amen? I want to show you what happens because this is what the Bible says. It says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. What does that mean? I want to show you guys this. I want to walk through this with you real quick. And by the way, guys, if you're following the model of Jesus, Jesus did this. Jesus did this. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, so he often withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus would lead the multitudes and get alone and pray by himself all the time, and he was Jesus. Amen? So if the Bible teaches us that Jesus is our example. So we already know right now we should be getting alone by ourselves and praying. And Jesus already said, when you pray, pray like this, right? But check this out. Check this out. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 1 through 3, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Let me set up the backstory right here. This guy's name is Bezalel. Y'all say Bezalel. I'm glad you got it, because the first time I tried it, it was like, Bezalel. That ain't right. <sighs> God tells Moses, he says, I want you to make me a place that I can dwell among my people. Because why? Why does God want to live where you are at? Because a good shepherd smells like sheep. Amen? Good shepherd don't smell clean. He smells like the sheep. He says, I want you to make me a place that I may dwell among my people. God said, Moses, I want to live where you guys are. I want to be where you're at. So I want you to make me a place. And then he, and Moses is like, yes, Lord, that sounds awesome. 
And then God says, and here's what I want. I want a temple that's, I want a tabernacle that's this big. It's got to be made of curtains that are 40 foot long, blah, 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 It's got to be made of this and that and so on and so forth. And you're going to have to get some acacia wood and you're going to have to cover that with gold, right? And you're going to have to make these poles and you're going to have to have these cherubim on this altar and it sits like this and these wings come across and they're cubits. You know what a cubit is? It's from here to here, right? So you, it's like God's just giving Moses all this stuff and Moses already got a stuttering problem. So when he sees the blueprints of the tabernacle, he's just like, ah, da, 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 da. you know what I'm saying? He's just, He's blown away by it. He's like, what? what? You know? He goes over to Aaron, who's his mouthpiece. He says, Aaron, what do you think? Aaron's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> none of them know how to do this. Moses, at this point in time, has only done three things in his life. Murdered a dude, led people, and listened to God. That's it. He's never built a thing. That's all he's done. He's like, God, I don't know about this tabernacle, but if you need me to knock off another Egyptian... I'm game, you know, Moses was a thug, I don't know if y'all know it, anyhow, so, but that's the truth, when he sees the blueprints, he's like, man, God, this, this is some immaculate stuff, but check this out, he's like, Lord, I don't know how to do this, and then, and then the Bible says in Exodus 31, verse 1 through 3, check this out, guys, because it's amazing, this is amazing, please get this, it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, see, I have called by name, y'all say, by name. Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. He's going to build this stuff. He's going to build this stuff. He said, I called Bezalel by name. By, why do you think God specifically said I called him by name? I literally called him by name. You know what Bezalel means? Bezalel means in the shadow of God. He said, I called him by name, and I filled him with my spirit in the shadow of God. The Bible says in Psalms 91, huh? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It sounds like Bezalel had been spending time in the secret place. Bezalel had been spending time with God in the secret place. God said, I called him by name. I called him by the actions of his name. I called him by name because he spent time in the secret place. And his name means in the shadow of God. Amen? And he said, I filled him with my spirit, with all understanding and wisdom and knowledge. I've given him gifts that is going to allow you to build the temple. Because what God does, what God sees you do in the secret place, he rewards openly. Amen? You understand? Fired up, Bill. Daniel, check this out, Daniel, Daniel's a young Jewish boy, young Jewish noble as a matter of fact, and he got carried away into Babylon, they changed his name and said, I want you to eat like this and so on and so forth, and Daniel didn't really, that's where we get the Daniel fast from, because he was like, no, nah, let me eat this way and I'll be just as healthy, and he showed him that he was and so on and so forth, and Daniel grew in wisdom and stature, and Daniel kept getting elevated in a foreign country, in authority, kept getting elevated, right? And Nebuchadnezzar, one time, he calls to him, and he's like, hey, man, I need somebody to interpret this vision. Daniel comes in there, he does it, no problem. No problem. But then Nebuchadnezzar died, and he had a son, Belshazzar, whatever. <laughs> it's a weird name. He's having a dinner party one night, and they've taken things from the house of God, and they've, they've made these cups and these bowls, and they're drinking, and they're, and, and they're getting drunk, and they're getting wasted at this party, and him and all of his friends, and all of a sudden, a, a, a finger start, comes and, and, and writes on the wall, and he can't read it. Finger comes and writes on the wall, and he can't read it. And, and the Bible says that he was so scared, he was literally, his knees were knocking, he was shaking. And his wife, the queen, came to him and said this, you can find it in Daniel 5.11, it says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. There's a man in your kingdom in who is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, the, uh, uh, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, childings, and soothsayers. He said, there's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. Let me call him. 
And they did. They called him, and Daniel came in, and he said, he said, Daniel, what does this mean? And Daniel said, I got some bad news. <laughs> You're going to die. <laughs> and he did that night. He did that night. And then after that, uh, King Darius took over. King Darius took over, and the Bible says that King Darius liked Daniel because of what? Because he had a spirit of excellence. He, the Bible says he had an excellent spirit. And he took him, and he put him in charge. There, he, he made 120 princes, and he made three presidents to govern those. And he put Daniel was the first of all of them. Daniel's had his, by this point in time, Daniel's had his authority in this country elevated three times. He is in charge. Amen? Why? Why? Because he was just chosen of God? Maybe. But I think the Bible tells us something else. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. We learn what happens when Darius raises him up. Those princes that, he, that Daniel had been put in charge of, they didn't like the fact that this foreigner was in charge of them. And they said, we've got to figure out a way to bring this man down. And they looked at him and said, the only thing that we're going to be able to get him on is his own laws from his own God. So they said, here's the deal. We'll make a statue. They went to the king and said, king, let us make a statue of you. And let us say for 30 days or something like that, that, that nobody's allowed to bow or pray to anybody but you. Because these kings at this point in time in Persia, they think they're gods. They think they're god kings. Darius thought he was a god. So Darius thinks it's a good idea. Now, he doesn't know this is all a trick to get Daniel. He, 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 he likes Daniel a lot. So he doesn't know this, and he says, that sounds like a great idea. 30 days, it's all about Darius. So he says, yeah, man, build the statute, sign the decree. Now, the people knew that if they signed the decree, that if the king signed the decree by law, he would have to enforce it. And they said, how about anybody who breaks this thing? We feed them to the lions. And that guy's like, okay, we'll do that. So they follow Daniel, and this is what happened. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Think about that. Now Daniel's in a country where God has given him wisdom. And the Bible says again, filled him with his spirit. In the Old Testament. Filled him with his spirit. And he's given, he's elevated his authority. He's given him wisdom. He's given him prosperity. He's given him favor all the days of his life. And then we find out that Daniel is spending time in the secret place alone with God. Since his early days. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Is that a coincidence? Maybe it's a coincidence. That there's two people that we see in the, in the, spirit, in, in, in the secret place praying to God alone and they get filled with the spirit in the Old Testament maybe that's a coincidence oh wait no it's not here's another one ah. this comes from the book of Exodus chapter 33 verse 11 this is talking about Joshua it said so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp but his servant Joshua the son of Nun a young man did not depart from the tabernacle of meeting he did not depart from the presence of God. So here's what would happen. The Bible says that, that the presence of God would fall at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and Moses would leave the camp of Israel and he would go up to meet with God. Meet with the very presence of God. Amen? He would go up there to meet with the, this is the manifest presence of God. This is where God's making himself known, right? This is the manifest that we talked about earlier. He would go up to meet with the manifest presence of God. And he would, the Bible says he would take Joshua, his aid, with him. Now Moses is in charge of leading the camp of Israel. He's in charge of going up there and leading and getting instructions for God. So the Bible says that the presence of God would speak to Moses face to face, friend to friend. And then what happened? Moses would get the instruction from the Lord. He would get the, the words of wisdom from God that he needed, the words of knowledge about the camp, need, do whatever he needed to do, whatever instruction God would give him. He would get that, and then he would depart and go back to the camp. But the Bible says that Joshua would stay. Catch this, because the manifest presence turned into the intimate presence as soon as Moses left. And it was just Joshua and his dad. 
Amen? Joshua loved the presence of God. He loved the presence of God. When Moses would leave, Joshua would stay in the presence of God. Amen? Why? Because the presence of God is addicting. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. It's where you're the happiest. It's where you're the strongest. Amen? That's where you were intended to be. So what happened to Joshua? What happened to Moses? Moses lost his patience. And as a result, he only got to see the promised land. He didn't get to go in it. Joshua led the people in. Check this out. I want you to see that this is not a coincidence. Numbers chapter 27, verse 18 through 20 says this. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit. All three of them. Filled with the Spirit in the Old Testament through spending time in the secret place with God. And lay your hands on him and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give him some of your authority that the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He's going to be their leader. You're going to give some of your authority to him. Why? Because he spends time in my presence. He spends time in my presence. Guys, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like getting into a place with the Father. And I'm not saying that you guys aren't doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm probably teaching some of you guys some stuff that you already know tonight, and that's fine. Because if there's anybody in here who doesn't understand how amazing your alone time with God is. Amen? Now, the fact that God is omnipresent and always around us, that's amazing. The fact that God has a manifest presence where when we come together, He shows up, that's amazing. But guys, the intimate presence of God, the alone time with God, will change who you are. It will change who you are. So my challenge to you is do that. Dedicate some time for the Lord and give to just Him. So this is just going to be me and Him. And spend that time alone and get your fullness of joy. Get your strength. Because that's exactly what you need to be sent out to not make converts of men, but to make disciples of men. Amen? Thank you, guys. Bill?